Okay, <clears throat> uh, my name is David Veal and I am uh, based at the South London Maudsley NHS Trust and I'm also based at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neurosciences at the King's College London and at the Priory Hospital North London. And as you can see at the moment, it looks like I'm somewhere in the north behind the northern lights behind me, which is pretty scary. Actually, what's even more scary is how my computer found this photograph and put it in as my background, <laughs> because that is, I'm still not quite sure how that happened, but it sort of found it and sort of made it into a background. Uh, so we'll take it as red. I'm now going to uh, share my uh, slideshow. And hopefully now you can see uh, my um, slides. And what I'm going to be talking today is about um, understanding the preoccupation in body dysmorphic disorder. And what I want to try and do is to unpick the nature of the preoccupation BDD. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We cannot see your slides, Professor Veal. Oh, right, sorry. I shall start again. <laughs> I thought I had shared it. We had not shared it. Thank you so much, Nicole. We will start again. <laughs> right, hopefully you can now see me. Is that all okay? Okay, so today I want to try and talk about um, trying to understand the nature of the preoccupation in body dysmorphic disorder. And um, I want to really try and unpick what it is and what it isn't um, because we know that uh, it's absolutely a crucial component of BDD um, and as you know the, the, the first criterion perhaps for the definition of BDD is preoccupation, preoccupation with a perceived defect or flaw that's not noticeable or appears only slight to others and so we're really going to focus in on that word preoccupation um, because that's the first, this is the first criterion in the International Classification of Diseases, 11th edition from the World Health Organization. And uh, on clinically, we might ask a, a, a patient or in a questionnaire, we might say on an average day, how many hours do you apparently spend thinking about your features? Could you perhaps try and add up all the time you're spending thinking about your features and make the best estimate? And so, you know, the preoccupation component is really much a, a thinking part. And usually more than an hour a day is preoccupation. Maybe for adolescents you can have a bit more, maybe up to two hours a day. But um, that's usually the sort of cutoff. You've got to have a cutoff somewhere, it's not ideal. But, you know, more than an hour a day is usually regarded as a preoccupation. And what we're going to be talking about in preoccupation is rumination or perseverative thinking. Now look, these are technical terms and I am trying to talk today uh, at people with, trying to aim my talk today at people with BDD. And I know that there are some therapists and professionals listening in, um, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be using these technical terms sometime, ruminating. It was actually first described in depression but it cuts across many mental health problems as this process and it tends to predict a poor outcome in other disorders you know if you've got suffering from depression or PTSD OCD this ruminating component process is is predicting a poor outcome and we know that with BDD it's difficult to treat and you know it's such a big component of of the uh, of the BDD um, and uh, what we can think of it is, are these repetitive loops of habitual thinking. And so you might use the term brooding or analysing or overthinking. And I suppose the first tip today would be try to agree with your therapist in terms of the term you're going to use for this process of 
excessive thinking yeah and you know the term ruminating is interesting because it comes from uh, the the um, zoological term of ruminators yeah so this is a group of animals that uh, chew the cud particularly cows and sheep and uh, goats and so on uh, as you can see they I looked this up actually they spend about eight hours a day uh, chewing the cud and you know it made me think that is pretty much the average amount of time perhaps most of my patients would be of spending chewing the cud yeah thinking about their features in terms of preoccupation yeah so i i think it's a, a very apt term and you know thinking a lot is not by itself bad so what i want to try and do first of all is try and separate out ruminating from just healthy reflection and so on so my, I, I suppose my main message today is going to be that ruminating is dangerous yeah as opposed to reflecting where it might be more creative playful it's a, it's a safe place yeah um, it's on ruminating you can think of being a very focused attention on the symptoms of your distress or its possible causes or consequences as opposed to solutions that was a definition of uh, depressive ruminating back in 1998 you can see as opposed to uh, trying to find solutions so healthy reflection is you know active problem solving and being very creative whereas ruminating is really inactivity I mean most times when you're ruminating you may well be doing nothing in, in terms of movement you might be lying down or you, you can be walking around but uh, it's generally inactivity but you're stuck in these repetitive loops going round and round and round uh, that that is the chewing the cud as opposed to healthy reflection you're acting according to your values yeah and ruminating of course can also become very self-critical as opposed to healthy reflection where you're much more self-soothing and encouraging of yourself and I was reflecting today god I've been thinking about and trying to understand uh, the nature of BDD for nearly 35 years and I'm hope I don't think most of the time it's been ruminating about it I think most of the time it's been reflective and it's been fairly uh, problems well some problem solving and trying to act according to my values and things and encouraging myself but um, th this would be something that is a healthy reflection should we say as opposed to ruminating about it and you'll see some examples in a minute um, one of my fantasies is we will one day have a government health warning somewhere that ruminating is dangerous and can kill yes so one of the things we might in the BDD foundation think about is um, suggestions actually for how to uh, attach that warning <laughs> to a product I'm not quite sure which product it is I mean certainly uh, many people when they're smoking may ruminate but um, you know not everybody, not everybody is smoking ruminates uh, but maybe we can think of other products we can uh, attach our government health warning to in terms of paying attention making getting yourself out of these loops and I'm going to argue today there are lots of different types of ruminating um, we can think of this as a rainbow or an umbrella of different types and it's often emotion led yes so we can and I'm going to go through each of these in detail but let's just give you an overview there's a more depressive type ruminating uh, the whys and the if onlys yeah that, that tends to be more depressive there's the shame type ruminating particularly where you're very self-critical judging and then BDD is going to be about you know ugly 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 uh, then there's there's this sort of more obsessional type doubting am I really as bad as looking as this uh, and that's often more prominent in sort of things like OCD and so on then there is the sort of anxiety worry type ruminating what if something bad happens 
Then there could be more anger at yourself or others. Let's say you're, you're thinking about some cosmetic surgeon being a total bastard or something and the damage they've done to you. Uh, then there's more responses, you know, the mental planning, particularly, you know, how am I going to do change my nose or whatever it is. Lots of comparing. How does my feature rank uh, compared to somebody else? Yeah. So I think that when, you know, when we're talking about preoccupation, there are all these different types of ruminating going on. And I suppose one of my first messages is to it is important often to try and recognize and label these emotions and different types of ruminating. Um, and, and it's certainly, you know, different people would be that you have different emphases. So sometimes they're a little bit more stuck in the anger, other times they're more stuck in the shaming. But, you know, all these types of ruminating will pop up at different times usually. So let's look at the first one, depressive ruminating. And we can think of this as trying to find bad reason, uh, trying to find reasons for bad events of the past or for the consequences now, for, for, for feeling bad now. So it's the sort of things like, why was I born so ugly? That sort of thing. Or trying to rewrite history as fantasy. If only I had not gone to that surgeon. And a, a, another key message today will be to try and understand the motivation for each of these types of ruminating. Uh, so here, this, this sort of depressive type ruminating, we know that when you're ruminating, it tends to suppress sadness and, and other healthy emotions. So the motivation might be to stop yourself feeling sad or hurt. But generally, it's usually trying to solve non-solvable problems like so that might, someone might say well if i can work out why i look so ugly then maybe i can fix it yeah so it looks like problem solving but of course it's it's not in the sense that it isn't actually a problem to be solved and you just go that's why you go round and round in in these circles and of course the unintended consequences of depressive type ruminating is you make yourself more depressed you become more isolated, not connected to others, more inactive, you know, all the things that are, make you more depressed. I, I'm just going to give a little warning here that just be a little bit careful. Sometimes ruminating may be in, unknowingly encouraged by some therapists, perhaps trying to help you to get to the bottom of it all and why your mother didn't love you or whatever. So <laughs> these are questions, of course, again, that cannot be solved. And sometimes these are what will come across as, as rabbit holes. I'm just saying, just be, a, you know, of course, it's important to have a good understanding of how your problems developed, but uh, it, you've got to be careful. The next type of ruminating I'm going to talk about is shaming, shame ruminating. Now, we know that many people with BDD, not everybody, has got this felt impression of how they appear to others. And it's like a sort of internal bully of uh, at themselves all the time. So we think of shaming can be either around the body shame, um, and this is the self-disgust and being very critical of yourself, just telling yourself how ugly and unattractive you are. They can also be more general shame. Uh, this fits more with the sort of depression and um, social anxiety where perhaps you are bullying yourself as being worthless or stupid and boring so these are things not to do so much with your appearance but just your general competence and so on um, and of course the problem in BD is you're very much defining yourself by your feature uh, and there's this very big discrepancy between how you see yourself and how you'd like to be and the bigger the discrepancy the more the distress so Whereas most of us have only got a small discrepancy uh, between the two, you know, I may, uh, I see myself a bit bald and, uh, which I am, and I'd like to have a bit more hair, The but it's not a demand, it's only a small discrepancy between the two. Whereas of course in BDD it's a very large discrepancy and that's what keeps the problem going. And there's this excessive self-focused attention and you act when you're shameful by trying to avoid situations, camouflage yourself, keep your head down, uh, 
and trying to keep yourself safe from others. Um, so that's the sort of shame type ruminating. And it's, it, you know, in terms of the preoccupation, it's usually this constant bullying of yourself, being excessively self-critical. And, you know, why, you know, the, the question is, why would anyone want to bully themselves? Well, often they have been bullied themselves when they were younger and they tended to internalize it. And the motivation now to bully yourself, of course, might be still to uh, improve your appearance, to improve yourself in some way. Um, and it might be to try and keep yourself safe from future rejections or humiliations. The idea, of course, is that you are better safe than sorry. That's the way your, your mind works. And the sorts of uh, beliefs about this might be, well, if I attack myself, it stops me from deluding myself that I look okay, or it mentally prepares me for being humiliated. The idea that you need softening up. Sometimes when it gets more severe, the idea is that you need to punish yourself, of course, because you deserve it. And that's, that's when it's getting really more severe and more difficult. But, you know, it's not surprising because the unintended consequences will mean, of course, that it increases preoccupation, self-consciousness, more distress, and it's another vicious circle, another loop of going round and round and round, which you never escape. Um, the next type of ruminating I'm going to put under the category of sort of doubt. And I think this is very much linked to intolerance of uncertainty and not knowing whether something's bad, even when there's no immediate threat. I think this very much comes up when you, uh, someone with BDD might have a, a mental image, a picture in their mind perhaps, or a felt impression of how they look. And then they begin to sort of doubt perhaps, you know, do I really look like that? Is it, you know, really as bad as that? And of course you may then motivate you to uh, go and check in the mirror, check with your fingers, you try to be rational with yourself and so on but of course uh, then you, you go and check or, or feel and then quickly you become very self-focused and it gets really stuck into that mental image and you go around in this loop again all the time trying to work out exactly how you do look so it feeds the doubts what we do know of course is the more you question uh, the, uh, and, and want certainty is that it has uh, unintended consequences. It will increase your preoccupation, distress and avoidance. And eventually, of course, um, all this uh, uh, intolerance of uncertainty means that you are unable to make a decision. And imagine, for example, a camel in the desert. It has a choice of two paths to go around. Uh, it knows that at the end of these two paths there is a well, and one of these wells has got dirty water in. And it cannot decide, you know, shall I go to this well down this path or shall I go to this well on the other path? And of course, the problem being for the poor camel is it can't make a decision. And what does it happen? Well, of course, it doesn't take the risk and it dies in the desert because it doesn't take any water at all, as opposed to perhaps getting ill for a few days. But, you know, being indecisive is a decision and it has consequences. What about other types of problems coming up uh, in ruminating? Well sometimes there's quite a lot of mental planning going on. Again maybe linked to looking in mirrors or trying to uh, work out which bit of you know, surgery you need or this that and the other. You're really again trying to solve the wrong problem uh, of trying to change or camouflage your appearance and the motivation here might be to give you hope about the future um, you know, the idea is if I plan what I can do to fix it, then perhaps it gives me hope and stops me from committing suicide. Um, so it's, it's, to, it's, it's to give you hope, this mental planning, but it's uh, what the unintended consequences again is, of course, it increases preoccupation and gives you a false hope. So, it, you know, it doesn't solve the problem at all. What about comparing? Well, again, um, a bit like the other types of ruminating, comparing is toxic. Um, and 
here, of course, in BDD, we've got lots of comparing of your feature with others or an old photo of yourself or an ideal from uh, that you want to be and so on. Now, this is very much linked, I think, to social ranking of your feature to to others to actually really know where you stand. And uh, once you know where you stand, of course, much less than others in that um, ranking, you then end up by being very submissive because that's going to reduce the risk of being attacked. And you see this, of course, in the animal kingdom. Now think of a puppy and a much bigger dog. It rolls over in submission because it's really telling the bigger dog that you don't need to attack me um, because I'm not a threat to you. Yeah? And you know this is linked to the shame when you're uh, acting in a very, it's very shameful. You're keeping your head down. You're trying to camouflage yourself. You are acting like that sort of puppy by being very submissive, uh, trying to tell people you don't need to attack me or humiliate me or reject me. I'm, I'm just in the background. Yeah? So the motivation, I think, of comparing is, again, to keep yourself safe. But, you know, the unintended consequences, of course, is uh, you're going to make yourself very depressed, uh, more preoccupied, more distressed, and it just feeds this, this vicious circle again. So the problem is all these solutions, whether it's comparing, mental planning, shaming, ruminating, uh, um, worry, and so on, all these solutions are the problem. They, they seem to work in the short term, but then that increases the preoccupation because you never get out of this cycle. And the problem is, of course, is uh, back to our old favourite slide from uh, Paul Gilbert is we have a tricky brain. Um, on the one hand, we have a, a new brain that's very much been very helpful for the evolution of, of humans because it is all about being very rational and planning and imagination and being creative and having self-awareness. But the Achilles heel of that new brain is to worry, to ruminate, to imagine the worst things that can go wrong. Uh, and that activates our old brain. And remember, the old brain is uh, evolved from reptiles and mammals and so on. And it has all these basic motivations to keep us safe, keep us in the right place and be able to uh, reproduce and, and, and survive. And Part of those that threat system, of course, is to fight and flight. And so when we're ruminating or worrying, it really activates that old brain, trying to keep us safe. And so this is the loop uh, between the new brain and the old brain. And this is, of course, the loop that keeps uh, mental health practitioners and psychologists and psychiatrists in business. There's a whole industry derived around this loop between the two, yeah? Uh, because you're stuck in these unhelpful loops when... At one level, you may know it's safe, and you may know that perhaps you know there may be a part of you that knows that this is an emotional problem, a body image problem. But the old brain says it's unsafe, and you need to listen to me. It's better safe than sorry. And you know this is uh, the the problem of being human, isn't it? Uh, in that, if only we were like a reptile or mammal, um, we would just be focusing on eat, survive, reproduce. But because we got this new brain, we have to think about it in terms of what's it all about and so on. And actually, interestingly, we often think uh, that the people who think most and the most in are the most intelligent. Yeah. And it's the most intelligent who suffer most. Yeah. And a very good, perhaps, solution for treating BD was to make you really stupid. In other words, zombify you, yeah? take your brain out, and then you wouldn't have to be thinking about the problem. So when we think about uh, the causes of ruminating, I'm suggesting it's very much a, partly a design fault of the human evolved brain. We wouldn't have designed it this way. Uh, we know that, uh, like many emotional disorders, it's partly heritable. Uh, about 40-50% is thought to be her a heritable type of problem in terms of your genes and so on. That doesn't mean you can't do anything about it, it just makes you perhaps more vulnerable. 
Um, I've suggested that intelligence makes it worse. Um, it may be other lots of things, childhood, poor attachments with your carers. This may also make a sense of poor sense of uh, um, yourself and uncertainty, which will feed your uh, likelihood of ruminating. And uh, often, particularly during adolescence, there may be adverse memories which have not been emotionally processed of being teased or bullied and so on. So I want to try and focus for the moment on the things that are maintaining, keeping the problem going, that you can change. So 10 strategies, everyone everyone's already going to have, going to have a list of 10 things. So I've come up with 10 things for ruminating. These are all part of cognitive behaviour therapy for uh, BDD, uh, or at least our protocol, and uh, you can read about those in the books. But I want to really try and really home in on this these ideas for, for what you can do about ruminating. And they are difficult, and we've got to develop better ways, but I think some of the principles here would be possible to develop more. So I think the first thing is to have a good understanding of your motivation or beliefs about the ruminating. And we've been trying to talk about some of those things uh, earlier about the different types of ruminating, haven't we? Uh, usually they're motivated by trying to make yourself safe, prevent yourself from being, I think, rejected or humiliated. Um, generally, they, they, they have this idea of trying to increase a sense of certainty and your ability to control things. Um, but they, they are trying to problem solve, but these are non-existent, non-solvable problems. Um, and it's usually one of these things, which is the sort of most, the, the, the sort of main motivating reason behind it. And you'll find that a lot of these things, they seem to work in the short term, uh, and that's why they're easily strengthened, but they have problems in unintended consequences in the long term. So one of the things you can do um, is to do what's called a functional analysis. This is a rather old fashioned thing to do, but um, it's often, I think, quite helpful for the uh, ruminating, the process. So uh, it, it's called an ABC. And you might look, first of all, at the antecedents or the trigger for ruminating. And this is essentially trying to find out well, what was happening before I started ruminating. What was the context in which the ruminating occurred? The B stands for behaviour and ruminating is a behaviour. Yes. Uh, so it's essentially what was I doing? And I'm saying that ruminating is, is a doing thing. The C is trying to understand the immediate consequences, which in learning theory terms will strengthen that particular behaviour. And we're suggesting that uh, some of those things like ruminating uh, suppresses sadness, it um, makes you feel more in control in the, in briefly or makes you feel more certain about something. Yeah? And that these, we think, are probably very powerful um, what's called reinforcers, things that strengthen, it makes it more likely to happen again in the future. Um, so usually this, you can usually ask yourself, you know, what happens immediately after you are ruminating? And that can be tricky to identify sometimes and may, may need unpicking. Or, but the other thing to really focus in on, what did I avoid? Was there a particular emotion that I was avoiding by ruminating? And then, of course, you get the unintended consequences, which you're very aware of. And that's what people tend to then bring to uh, mental health practitioners, others for help. They want help with the unintended consequences. And this is what happens later. Like I get depressed, I get very preoccupied, I get uh, my life is messed up and so on. But I'm saying that you really need to work backwards for each of these events to really understand what the motivation is, what's keeping it going. So uh, here's a, an example of an ABC. Um, I had a picture on my mind of how I looked and I hoped I didn't look as bad as I thought I did. So that would have been the trigger. So I, that much so my behaviour is to ruminate, trying to work out whether I look as bad as I think as I think I do. And I may go to the mirror or, 
or something like that. And the immediate consequence is, I, you know, I felt certain very briefly, perhaps, um, whether I looked as bad as I didn't. But then the unintended consequences were, well, I'm now on my own for several hours. I feel more depressed. I'm more preoccupied. I've got more doubts. My partner's more critical. And that's now feeding things. So it's just going round and round in these loops. Yeah, that, that would be an example of trying to do a functional analysis on the process of ruminating. So the first thing I guess to really ask yourself is, does ruminating really help you achieve what you want in life? Yeah? Does it really help me solve my problem? For how many years have I been trying to work out the solution? Does it really help or hinder me in doing what's important in my life? Is trying to solve the problem the actual problem yeah it's trying to solve this problem the actual problem needs to be solved is it really working in my long-term interests so you'll see that when you are questioning this process yeah you're not discussing with yourself or your therapist the content of the rumination you're not getting stuck into um, whether you're ugly or what exactly your nose looks like or whether you're going to be alone all your life or things like that. You're not getting involved in the content. You're just focusing in on this process and you're using a very pragmatic approach in terms of whether it you know, does it really help you. And that I think is, is the key to really tackling um, ruminating. And the second uh, strategy we're going to discuss is self monitoring. Because one of the difficulties, about, especially about ruminating, not so much about the worry type um, ruminating, is it's such a habitual automatic process that you may not be aware of when you're ruminating. Yes. So that the idea of trying to um, self-monitor, and that could be a pen and paper, uh, when you, where you're most ruminating and when you're ruminating and so on, is... To increase awareness and, and I'm sure there are apps as well for this I'm sure someone will tell me about that um, so you might want to identify which type of ruminating you're doing um, which particular emotion you're experiencing but the point being is that these are because ruminating is so automatic the habit becomes the new normal if it's very frequent you know so it's several thousand times or whatever a day then you might be wanting perhaps to use a tally count with a little thing you you know um, like I've just shown you on the picture um, and the point being is that if you don't know when you're ruminating you can't choose not to ruminate yeah so you have to really be aware of when you ruminate and, and the, the only thing here you can do is to really train yourself to like a third eye to observe and monitor when you're ruminating yes so the next thing is of course if you are becoming more aware of it you pay full attention because um, what we do know is that when you're ruminating your attention becomes very self-focused and inwards on yourself so it's very important to try and pay full attention to the moment in the moment in other words attend closely to what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you can taste, touch, or the task at hand, yeah? And uh, it may be gaming or whatever, but whatever it is, um, you have to really keep focused on the task. This is tough, I understand. Um, and what you're trying to do is to reduce that self-focused attention. And you can monitor the amount of attention, the percentage of attention on yourself, and the percentage on the task and the environment. So, you know, if you're ruminating and self-focused, you might have about 80, 90% attention on yourself and maybe only 10, 20% on the task and the environment. And uh, you may be surprised to know that when you're not ruminating, it's the other way round. So you may have about 80% attention on your task and the environment and maybe only about 10% on 10, 20% on yourself, yeah? But the key thing is to monitor and be aware 
of how much attention you have on yourself. So uh, once, once, you know, when you are trying to pay attention, the key thing is to be aware of these rabbit holes. Yeah. So if you are, uh, uh, if you're not a rabbit hole, sorry, if you're not a rabbit, then rabbit holes are dangerous. They are dark and literally a maze of twists and turns. You know, they are designed to keep the predators out and so dogs often get lost or stuck in them. And, you know, from the outside, the rabbit hole looks quite tempting and interesting. Now, if you step inside and try to find an answer, of course, to your question, um, you may easily trap as and of course, the further you go down this maze of time, solve non existent problems. Past, maybe having found a question or something. You know, was it really helpful to do so in the long term? Yeah, or was it more like scratching an itch if you if you have uh, eczema or something? So, message: spot the rabbit holes. Pay full attention to the world as it is. Uh, stick to a path, and choose either to go down the rabbit hole and actually see what effect it has or stay on the track and just do the things in life which are important to you, despite the way you feel. Yeah? So really think of ruminating as rabbit holes and you, know, you have a choice whether to go down that rabbit hole or not. But, but the most important thing is to really spot it coming because the earlier you can see your, your, the way you, you're starting to ruminate, the easier it is to get out of it. Now here's a topical thing we're all being of course told to social distance from others stick two meters away wash your hands and so on and uh, it's a very sensible thing to do if we don't want to get infected but what we can also do when you're ruminating is a keep safe distance from your thoughts yeah so try and, and this is tough again this is difficult to try and distance yourself from your thoughts and not become uh, engaged with them in the way that you would normally in normal circumstances in the shop and talk to someone you're sticking a safe distance from people and it's all very strange but it's a bit like that we're trying to keep a safe distance from your thoughts yeah you notice them you're aware of them but you're not engaging with them it's a bit like um, this analogy of trying to allow your thoughts just to pass to notice them to be aware of them they're, they're a bit like cars passing the streets uh, and you do not try to stop the car or direct it in another attention a direction because this is all control strategies you know, you're just walking on the pavement being aware of the cars that are passing but you're not trying to control them because that would be foolish because you probably get run over or you, if, even if you manage to take over a car and park it and sort it out, another one comes along. Yeah? So you do not want to go into your head and try and start controlling these thoughts that are passing. Another thing you can do is just try and label those thoughts. Do you remember we, we talked about the different types of thoughts, that there's a worry um, type of rumination, or these are shaming ones, or this is a depressive one. Um, you know you just label it just well done that's a fantastic example of depressive ruminating just try and stand back notice observe label these particular thoughts yeah or you know i'm having an invention a thought that i'm ugly it's it's just noticing that you're happy these things are happening but you're not starting to engage with them and i understand this is really tough these are this is really difficult because this is not something you're probably used to doing uh, and you're trying to reverse a pattern of behavior and thinking which is very difficult to do. It requires lots of mental training. Try to perhaps distract yourself. This is now when you're getting stuck into ruminating, yes? Um, you've got to be a little bit careful. 
not to avoid motions like sadness if you're going to distract yourself. Um, so that's why I'm saying you really want to think about the function at the time. So, you know, there are all sorts of things you can do, which you might well have been doing in your shutdown. Uh, listen to music, sing a song, learn an arpeggio, learn a language, play Sudoku, use a colouring book. I mean, look, look, look what you, whatever pays your fancy, you really got anything that really helps you to take your attention away from your inner world and ruminating towards actually something more productive. Um, <laughs> turn those questions of whys and if onlys and ugly and so on into hows. How type questions of what actually needs to be solved. I see here I put a picture of Jerry and the pacemakers. How did you do it? Uh, <laughs> I have to say I was not around as a kid when they were doing that. Uh, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> how so the sorts of real questions to try and solve is how can I do what's important to me in life? Yeah, that is the real question to be solved. So actually try and problem solve the actual problems that are being avoided. Yeah. So, you know, the best antidote to ruminate is really to make sure your structure, plan your daily life according to what you've been avoiding and what you value. It's very important not to act by how you feel stick to a routine uh, get up by 8 a.m uh, open the windows let the sunlight in um, and, and you know and stick your day according to the, the natural sunlight and rhythms again do not ever get into the content of your ruminating yeah do not always focus on the how how am i going to do the things in life which are important to me and how can I structure my day and do the things which are important to me? And therefore, what you're trying to do is to act on those value directions. This is an influence of uh, the therapy called ACT, and they're very much focused on trying to do things according to your values and what's important in your life. And of course, value directions are not the same as goals. You know, you might have a goal, I want to get married and have killed children. That might be a goal, but actually, the value is about being a good partner and a good parent and is all your life. You never stop doing that until you die. So try and identify those value directions in your activity plan. So you're not just doing something for the sake of doing it or doing it for God's sake for pleasure. No, you're really trying to do things according to what you value and what's important in your life. Because these things are much more likely to be successful. I'm not not seriously suggesting that we don't do anything that's not pleasurable, but uh, I'm just saying try and focus on what you're avoiding, what you value, and what a bit of some pleasure in your life as well. And you know, we've been talking about that bully, particularly when you're shaming yourself. What we do need more of when you're ruminating is about sort of compassionate self talk. Um, and this takes time, that sort of mental training, your relationship with yourself. And remember, compassion is about being non-judgmental, accepting that it's not your fault that you've got a tricky brain, you've got some maybe some difficult genes, you've been shaped by various things in your environment, and particularly your early experiences. But it's your responsibility now to change, and no one else can do it for you. So the compassion involves being kind and motivated to care for yourself, trying to try to understand why uh, the, the motivation for ruminating, trying to be more emotionally connected to yourself, encouraging and wise and tolerating the distress. And so, you know, typically you might be saying to yourself, look, I understand this is tough. Let's just try and stick with it. Let's just do it. Yeah, but this is more helpful, compassionate self-talk uh, rather than the ruminating. And Sometimes in uh, BDD, not less than in OCD, there is some reassurance seeking of exactly how you look and so on, um, or trying to reassure yourself um, uh, when you're very distressed and wanting more certainty, of course. And again, it's very important that you don't discuss the content of the worry or what exactly you do look and for, for relatives not to discuss the content. but. It's important to seek emotional support and use that compassionate self support talk. So it's very important to be able to say to a family member or partner or someone close to 
that I'm feeling anxious. Can you give me a hug? Uh, well, at least if they are non-coronavirus um, uh, part of your bubble. But uh, the key thing is to connect and not to discuss the content of these worries. And then related to that, of course, is these doubts and an intolerance of uncertainty, which, you know, definitely, I think, occurs within BDD. And I think part of the problem is, is this excessive information load. Uh, there are mental images, there are mirrors, there are selfies, there are old photos. You're constantly being bombarded with different ways of looking at yourself. And these are going to be, by definition, contradictory in different lights and different moods. And it's not surprising that they will feed the uncertainty and the doubts. So it's very important just to say nothing towards yourself. Just resist that urge and just to accept you don't know exactly how you look. And that's not what's important. It's, it's, uh, there are many other things which are important in your life. What about the what if type worries? Uh, so this is more classical uh, general anxiety and worry, but you know, obviously it does come up in BDD as well. And the key thing is, you know, the, the, the uh, worry is always about what if and catastrophizing about the future, whereas depressive ruminating is much more about the past and how you feel and, this, and the shaming in terms of the ugly and criticism. Here we're focusing on what if, what if these bad things will happen in the future. So the key thing here I think is to accept what is possible and prepare for it by action, usually by things like role play. Uh, and that's the reason why we do a fire alarm test because it is possible even if it never seems to happen um, and you prepare for it, you plan for it by uh, doing, um, going out and doing the things you need to do in a fire alarm. So um, try to identify those particular worries you have. If it's a worry, you know, someone says something about your feature, maybe it would be helpful to actually do a role play with someone or your therapist or someone to actually prepare and plan for what would you do or say, how would you deal with this idiot who wants to talk about your nose or whatever. What if someone ignores me? Well, again, Practice it. Imagine that scenario in a role play if someone ignores you and how you're going to deal with it and how you're going to um, pick it up with your friend and so on. So uh, I think worries can be dealt with if you prepare for them and plan for them. And I appreciate that that doesn't work for everything. Um, and uh, sometimes the, the ruminating is linked to particular imagery and, and difficult memories. And I would, you know, not only did uh, my colleague Rob Wilson do some of the, collect all the data on this uh, for imagery scripting, but he also collected some of the other data on motivations for ruminating and so on, which we still got to publish. But um, the key thing here is that sometimes, maybe about a third of people, uh, your felt impression, your, your picture in your mind may be linked to past adversive memories, experiences like teasing, bullying, uh, sexual abuse, changes that occurred during adolescence and so on. Or just things perhaps you've observed as an adolescent when you were younger. And we can use uh, something called imagery scripting, help change some of these associations and update the memories. There may be other approaches people can use, which we don't have so much evidence on, and things like uh, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, EMDR. Uh, but the point being is that sometimes, and we don't want to do this, take up too many sessions with it, maybe just one or two, but the point is that sometimes it can be helpful to be able to go back to some of these early experiences and update them uh, in order so that they, they no longer have that sense of nowness and may have a more realistic uh, uh, belief and, and, and meaning attached to those early experiences. So that is uh, my conclusion for the end of today. I want you to uh, really try to identify these different types of ruminating, all of which are very repetitive, habitual, um, and really 
notice what type of ruminating they're doing. So I think it's important to really understand the motive behind it so you understand what's maintaining it, what's keeping it going. Try to be more aware of when you ruminate. Take time to develop these alternative skills. It is tough to reverse, uh, to be aware and pay attention and not go down that rabbit hole. But try and keep practicing full attention externally or specific tasks. Try to distance yourself from those thoughts. Uh, label the thinking style. Distract yourself from your inner world of ruminating. Turn those questions into how, how can I do the things in life which are important to me and actually structure your day. Uh, act upon those values. Tolerate the uncertainty and doubt and turn your worries into preparation for the worst and bad things happening. And sometimes it can be helpful to update those aversive memories because that will help you to no longer have to ruminate and get rid of them all the time. So um, I, that I think has come to the end. Uh, I should have said I forgot because <laughs> I was reminded that um, particularly for the therapists and professionals today listening in, please do donate something to the charity on the web page. There is a little donate button uh, because we want to build the charity and really help people to uh, be understanding what the nature of BDD is and uh, to direct them in the right way and show them and, and in the long term to encourage the research and find better ways of treating BDD. So I think we're now able to take some questions. I think we've still got time for questions. Is that right, Nicole? Uh, and I go up here and I can see my questions and answers. Right. Ooh. Um. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, S Sandeep. What strategies are there to keep a safe distance from your thoughts? Well, I think it's one of those things where the principle is very important, but actually trying to apply it is bloody difficult. Um, and I think it takes time to practice, certainly to be aware and to try and notice and stand back and not judge them, experience them and so on. And not to get involved in them, trying to, I think the most important thing is not to try and solve them and not get involved in the content of them. Uh, I, I'm going to acknowledge it is very tough, but that is the, the principle always to aim towards. And I hope that we've talked about some of the other uh, issues that uh, all things that I think will, you know, a lot of these strategies we talked about all overlap to a certain extent with one another and they will all help towards it. But I acknowledge that, you know, more work needs to be done, more research to retry really and work out what is the best way of getting a out of the ruminating because it is it can be so toxic but I, I personally think I think the key thing is being aware of when you ruminate and where these rabbit holes are the particular contexts and situations where they occur so you can be um, alert not to go down them you know? so someone says here during distraction why should we avoid motions like sadness no I think what we're saying here is not to avoid emotions like sadness. I do apologise if we um, came across unhelpfully on that. What I'm saying is, look, sadness is a healthy emotion. There's often times when you need to be able to process losses in your life and things which are difficult. Sadness is an okay emotion. Uh, and if you ever watch the film, of course, um, done by Disney Pixar of uh, Inside Out, you'll see it was the sadness that won the day. And if the little girl had not felt those sadness, she wouldn't have come out of her depression. So, you know, sadness is a normal, healthy emotion and it's very understandable. It's okay, yeah? So, so you're not, what, so what I'm suggesting is don't try to distract yourself from sadness and that ruminating sometimes is a way of trying to suppress the sadness, yeah? Um, ooh, someone says, is there any tips on differentiating between BDD and perfectionism or OCD? 
I mean, it's interesting that many people with BDD are actually not perfectionists. They just want to be able to fit in uh, because they see themselves as very much down there. They just want to be normal. It's true that there are some people who not just don't want to be normal, but they want to be up there and perfect, as it were, in some way. But um, I think, that, in my experience, that's a minority. Um, and in OCD, it's very much more part of your tem temperament, uh, where it's linked often to uh, being having what's called an obsessive compulsive personality, where you are trying to be, well, you're maybe very conscientious and very rigid in your thinking and want things just so and uh, very tidied and ordered and so on. And, you know, the perfectionism is really these excessively high standards, usually based upon more, um, so it, it, these excessively high standards may be occurring in BDD. I'm just saying it's a minority, but it's just that in, in OCD and other conditions, it's a more general thing and not related linked necessarily to one's appearance yeah um, Stephen uh, says uh, turn your worries into preparation for the worst well I think what I'm trying to say here because it because seems con con got concerned doesn't this feed the problem um, no because I'm saying that with worry you just go round and round without trying to solve the problem or it just moves on to something else very quickly. So what I'm suggesting is that actually if you can practice preparing for the worst and actually do it as if it's happening, um, so in much that, you know, a bit like, let's say you're worrying about um, a job interview coming up and what do they say this and what do they say that, then the best thing to do with it is a role play and actually practice as if you're having that job interview. You know, always, in other words, you're getting it out of your head and actually practicing for the things that will come up and preparing yourself for it. So um, I don't think it necessarily feeds the problem. I'm not saying it's the solution always. You'd have to think this through. But I'm just saying sometimes it can be helpful in, in BDD to identify what it is that you exactly fear and then prepare for it. Yeah. Um, Now then, someone says, when I talked about doubt and uncertainty as to what you look like, to say nothing to yourself and resist the urge to explore this yourself for others, right? Is the theory that over time these doubts about what you look like will become less severe and rise less often? Yes, what I'm suggesting is that the more you try to question them and get certainty, the more uncertainty you create. I mean, think of um, that... TV program who wants to be a millionaire and the uh, questioner Tarrant would say to the uh, <laughs> respond the the um, say to the respondents of course are you absolutely sure yeah and of course this is for a reason because the more that you he can help them question their answer the more uncertainty and the less confident they will be about their answer yeah what we do know is saying is that the more you question something the more it increases your uncertainty and doubts yeah it it, it just makes it worse yeah um some uh, becker has asked whilst i'm sat what wanting to encourage further exploration of rumination and getting into the rabbit holes of specifics do you ever find that avoidance of it leads to a sense of shame my therapist doesn't want to hear it as it's shameful. Hmm. I'm trying to think about how to answer that because it's, it's probably not enough information for me. Um, I think what you're... It's okay to explore something in a safe place so long as you don't start the shaming of yourself and being self-critical about it and that, and that will be starting to go down the rabbit hole so you can explore something in a non-judgmental way and try to you may there may be sadness and other difficult emotions that come up but it's important not to analyze to overthink it through yeah but just you're more experiencing something and you may be using things like imagery and trying to rescript what some 
experiences in the past in a more helpful way. Um, someone has asked, if someone was to have the value of beauty, how might you advise that they live with that value and not engage with the BD symptoms? Well, yeah, I think this is what we call an overvalued idea. The problem is in, in uh, it's become an idealised value in uh, BDD, where you see yourself as just an aesthetic object, as everything is devoted to that beauty. So the problem is you might appreciate beauty. And what we do know from research and so on is that probably about 20% uh, of people with BDD have particular skills in being able to appreciate art and beauty. And they come from all sorts of uh, backgrounds where art and education and tr in, in beauty. Um, and they may have higher aesthetic sensitivity, therefore. But the problem is making sure that you don't then just apply that to yourself and define yourself through uh, your appearance. In other words, you know, you're more than just beauty, as it were. You know? um, can BDD ever be about feeling scruffy and a fear of being shamed by not looking well, Kent? Sure. I mean, in the sense that if it's a preoccupation and um, it's, it's uh, causing you significant distress and uh, interference in your life, and it means that you are doing lots of repetitive behaviours and avoiding situations, sure, that, that can definitely be, um, can be quite a general thing about just look, being scruffy. You know? um, I think my mum and boyfriend have BDD to varying degrees, so do I. Do you have any advice about protecting yourself when affected or triggered by other people's BDD issues? Oh God, yeah, I'll just dump the mum and boyfriend. Um, other than that, <laughs> you may have to train them, yes, in terms of really trying to have a conversation that these are difficult issues for you and you'd really appreciate it, I think, if we could talk less about these things. Um, I think other than that healthy communication and really trying to explain how you feel and what effect it has on you and um, we'd really appreciate if they if we could discuss about these things in a different way uh, you might get somewhere that way yeah oh god here we go um, how do you treat someone when they tell you that a physical feature is horrible and you as a therapist can only agree Obviously, without telling them. Well, this is a classic BDD question, isn't it? And fear, I think. Um, the problem is, I think I responded to this earlier, was the problem is, is that people view this feature as somehow defining themselves, that this is their self. It's a bit like, I think you might have seen earlier, that walking nose, that even if a, the nose is not the best in the world, um, it defines them. They are just a walking nose. Whereas, of course, people are much more complicated than that. You know, it's not, we keep coming back to this thing over and over again in the ruminating. The issue is not one's appearance, it's the preoccupation, the distress, the ruminating, the repetitive behaviours, all these things, and really trying to define yourself through your appearance. That is the problem, you yeah? know? Um, what's the best way to inform and educate dermatologists on BD in order to identify BD symptoms and approach them in order to refer them? Well, um, I and Rob and all the other, some of the other people in the um, trustees of the BDD Foundation, we are regularly uh, informing, educating cosmetic surgeons, dermatologists and so on. I was uh, an interesting webinar the other day with us told 4,000 cosmetic practitioners who had been unable to function at present during shutdown and they were all over the world uh, and I was teaching them and telling them about BD. So I think we have to, you know, we, we, we do all these things all the time. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we, I think the message is getting out to try and identify, be aware of these things and try to refer people on towards uh, psychological, 
practitioners and psychiatrists rather than to their worst enemy down the road when they want to get rid of someone because I'm afraid that's what happens as well why don't you go and see my colleague down the road I think they may be able to best help you sort of thing um, um, I think it's now God it's five past eight um, I'm hoping Nicole's going to rescue me because I think we got through most of the questions um, I'm hoping that was being helpful for you uh, and I'm hopefully being aware if you're a therapist and, and uh, uh, people with BDD the, the importance of trying to really identify your ruminating what type of ruminating it is and really trying to think about what best things you can do to get out of your head and really into the world which is a lot more interesting place because inside your head really may be quite dangerous and we need to get you out of there thank you